Hey guys, I've been trying to shoot a video about the one time that Acura sold me a car that had been in a collision, but it's not gonna be possible here while I charge the car. So we're gonna go home and I'm gonna tell you my story. This happened a long time ago, but I think the story is still current because a lot of people don't know that they could be driving a car that, it, that has damage on it and the dealerships are not obligated to disclose this damage unless the damage is over 6% of the MSRP. What? Imagine a $60,000 car. How much is that? Help me with the math because I'm not that brilliant. But anyways, I think this story has some value. I was talking to a friend at work and he said, you need, you need to put stuff like that on your channel because a lot of people don't know about these things. So hopefully you can stick around for the duration of the video and maybe learn a thing or two about the process and what I went through and how you can avoid this from happening to you too. This story is very old. How old? 19 years old. In this video, I'll tell you what happened to me and what I did at the time. Keep in mind that there were different times and in those times we didn't rely as much on the internet as we do today. So information wasn't, I mean, it was there, but it wasn't as readily available as it is today. With the experience that I'm about to share with you, I learned that dealerships are not your friends, that their bottom line is their main priority, not you, the customer. And they'll do anything to push a sale. And that's why I hate dealerships in the first place. Their devious behavior, their lack of transparency during a transaction. A lot of people deal with high levels of anxiety when visiting a dealership to buy a new car. They are afraid of paying too much money for the car or signing into a high interest finance contract or things like not understanding the sales agreement altogether. To that, add the possibility of buying a car that has prior damage when it's supposed to be brand new, like in my case. In 2003, I bought my first new car. I still remember that I was very happy. It was a 2004 Acura TSX. Now the model has been discontinued, but back then it was a hit for Acura. And I chose the Acura TSX because number one, it was within my budget. And as a teenager that I grew up in the late 80s, there was an era where brands like Lexus, Acura, and even like Infiniti had built a reputation for premium vehicles that were reliable, that were efficient. They had small displacement engines that gave you more for your money, especially compared to the Europeans and to the American offerings. The Acura TSX was a small sedan that was actually the European Accord. It had a 2.4 four cylinder that was normally aspirated and it produced over 200 horsepower. And at the time that was pretty respectable because think that the 325i in 2004 was pushing 184 horsepower and that was a six cylinder engine. And when you compared a, a similarly equipped BMW to the TSX, the BMW was about $10,000 more. And it was just love at first sight. I still consider the first generation TSX to be a great looking car. It has aged very gracefully, and I still see them out on the road today. They're very reliable cars. It was definitely an upgrade for what I was driving at the time. It was the 1999 Pontiac Grand Am GT, which was an absolute POS. The price of the TSX was slightly over $28,000 because it was stock, but it had a rear spoiler that was dealer installed otherwise it was completely stock one of Acura's strongest selling points back at the, back in those days was the simplicity of their packages there was only the base model and the navigation package so it was very easy to order stock it came with leather seats that were perforated and they were heated out front and they had dual zone automatic climate control a powered sunroof you had a very nice stereo that had like an in-dash cd changer which was huge and it had HID lights that I loved. It was my first car with HIDs. The color was carbon gray pearl. It was just like a dark gray and a, a light gray interior. It's just a beautiful car, not a head turner, just an understated smooth high revving sedan back when sedans were popular. I didn't even negotiate the price of the car because I just, I just lay down and took it. I was just so happy that I could get myself into a brand new car. Not only was, was it my first new car, it was the first car I ever financed. So the APR was 4.9. And since my credit wasn't that good, I just figured they did me a favor by selling me a new car. And I also bought a service agreement, like an extended warranty for $1,400 because I was gonna keep this car forever. I was so in love with it and I needed to protect my investment. And as much as I wanna admit that I did horribly attempting to negotiate the price of the car, I was very happy that I did negotiate the financing from like 6% to 4.9. And also the price of the extended warranty is, it was originally like $2,300 and I brought it down to $1,400. And by the way, I now consider the standard service agreements to be a ripoff and mostly a waste of money, but I'll leave that for another video. 
The car just turned out to be a great experience. And in the summer of 2006, almost three years later, I just had the bug for a new car again and I put my Acura for sale. And that's when the story begins. I went through the autotrader.com appraisal process and it appraised my car to be in excellent condition. And as such, autotrader thought that my car was worth $23,000. I was so happy because I had driven the car for like 53,000 miles and it had retained so much value. And I still owed, I mean, like $21,000. So I had $2,000 for myself for my future car and I was going to sell a private party. So everything was lined up and I put my car for sale. I got so many calls like right away. And the only thing it was that, I mean, it was a very popular car, right? Uh, Acura's perception of quality, it was, it was big. And then the fact that my car had that extended service agreement that was transferable, it just made my car, made my car so desirable for a future buyer. And as soon as I put it for sale, I started getting many calls. But the problem was that at the time I was living in a town that was like an hour and a half east of San Diego, it's called Calexico. And most of the callers were from like San Diego and LA. So it made it difficult for them to uh, drive all the way out there to check out my car. And that's when this guy from LA called me and uh, he said if I wanted to meet halfway, that he was very interested in the car and we could just go to the bank and he'll pick up the car from me. So we met at a shopping center and he showed up with somebody else. And I remember that he got out of the car and as soon as he got out, we introduced ourselves. He started looking at the car and it didn't take him maybe a couple of minutes, seconds, he just looked at me in complete disappointment and said, you should have told me that this car had been in an accident. It would have saved us both a lot of time. And my heart just sank. And he was like, this has been a complete waste of time. I was like, hey, my car has never been in an accident. I bought this car new. What are you talking about? Could you please show me? Show me where the car is damaged. And with the help of his friend, they opened the hood. So he said, look, the hood, the bumper, the fender, the passenger door, front door, and the running board underneath, they all have body work and it's really bad body work by the way he said. He was, he was acting kind of pissed off and I was confused and I was also embarrassed first because that the guy was trying, that the guy thought I was scamming him when in reality I thought he was trying to pull a scam on me, right? And then I was also mad because the dealership had fooled me three years earlier selling me a car that was supposed to be new um, that had damage. So I just saw my plan of buying a new car just fly away. I felt betrayed, cheated, defrauded. My first new car purchase had been a complete scam. And understand that this happened almost two decades ago. So even though the, the laws were fairly similar to what they are today, consumer resources such as the internet were not as developed as they are today. I do remember consulting with a local lawyer who didn't specialize in lemon law, but he was, able to he was able to advise me that I had a good case of fraud by the dealership and that I could take him to court and most likely I would win. And if, if I did, then the dealership will be responsible for reimbursing me for each and every dollar spent on the car throughout my ownership. And I'm talking about the down payment. I'm talking the finance charges that I paid throughout the years, every single penny. He also told me that I should go just talk to them and tell them what happened and see what they're willing to do to make to make things right. He said to also that it was going to be a long process. So it was maybe better to go try to negotiate something with the dealership and just fix it without going to court because it was just going to be a long case. So I did. I drove to San Diego 120 miles and then I went to a dealership and I spoke to the manager. He took me into his office and I told him what happened and he was just listening to me in silence and he was writing stuff down and um, he just took a piece of paper, walked out of the office for a few minutes, and then he came back later and said that he was a new manager and he was new to that dealership as well, and that he wasn't there when the sale took place, that all the information that he had in the car was that the vehicle was a transfer from a store in Los Angeles. I mean, in retrospect, I could have done a lot more than what I did, but at that time, I just wanted out of the car. I asked him uh, to buy the car from me for what I had it advertised online. And he immediately agreed. And he also asked me if I wanted to get anything from the lot. And because I drove myself to the dealership, I, I just felt, wow, I just pick up a car from here. And at the time, the 2006 Civic SI was barely hitting the dealerships. It was, I, I'm, earlier I said summer was February of 2006. So they were asking markups for that Civic SI. So I told him that I wanted the SI, but I was not willing to, to pay the $2,000 markup. And he agreed. So I paid MSRP for the Civic SI. So all in all, I felt good that I got to fix the issue and that I drove home in a brand new car. And as I said earlier, 
I now know that I could have done a lot more, but at the time I just didn't want to, didn't want to invest the time in litigation. I had known of Lemon Law through a friend that had a case of a defective GMC Denali and part of what he dealt with was the fact that he had to park the Denali for the duration of the case or at least that's what I understood from him and I just didn't feel like dealing with that headache. I also found out that dealerships do not have to disclose damage on a new vehicle unless it exceeds 6% of the MSRP. In my case, that would have been $1,700 and my car had a lot more damage than that. It wasn't a fender bender, it was an actual collision. It was probably worse than what could be seen at the surface. And I also remember how I chose the car. It was because I had test driven a, a pearl white with like a, like a tan interior or something. And it had like wood accent. This is not my style, right? So as we walked by the cars, I saw the one I bought, it was very dusty. And I told the salesman, his name was Louis. Hey, that's the one I want. And he's like, are you serious? I, now I remember that look like he knew something about it. So yeah, so I chose that one. We went and we did the paperwork. And I do remember that they extended the initial warranty to reflect the 300 miles that the vehicle had on the odometer. I now know that that's common practice. A lot of new vehicles have some miles on them. I mean, it's nothing out of the ordinary. When I bought my Tesla Model Y, the car had like 46 miles, I think. And I, did rem I do remember that when they called me from Tesla, they said that they might be driving the vehicle from like a central location and I was okay with it. So I learned my lesson is that you must inspect the vehicle thoroughly, even if it's a new car. Obviously I'm not an expert, so it would be hard for me to spot uh, repair damage in a vehicle, but that Acura had really bad work so bad that you could actually see the streaks like when you sand something under the paint and then the paint was chipping as well uh, monday morning quarterback in this and with the typical if i knew then what i know now i would have done things uh, a lot different like i would have gone the long route and i would have sued the dealership in demand for all of my money back up to the last moment of the making of this video i was debating if i should mention the name of the dealership but I'm not going to, um, but believe me, it's 100% real. This story actually happened to me, unfortunately. And I'm omitting the name of the Acura dealership to concentrate on the subject matter that it, it is a common practice and that us customers have to be more careful when giving our money to these businesses. Please let me know in the comments if you ever dealt with something similar. Did you ever file a lawsuit against a dealership for fraud or lemon law? Did you win? Did you lose? Was it a long um, painful case was it worth it because when I think in retrospect I would have driven that car for almost three years because it was a great car I just didn't know the car was damaged and I would I would have taken the dealership to court I would have won and I would have gotten all my money back down payment the finance charges and all that so it would have been great to dump all that money onto my following vehicle but I just didn't know enough at the time um, so I want to hear from you and if you had a similar experience Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.